I have decided on a way to calculate who are my favorite authors. The favorite author formula goes like this. In order for an author to be considered a favorite author, they need a score of at least one, which is equivalent to 100% favorite author status. So I look at every book I've ever read from that author and what I rated that book. From five stars down to one star. So for every book I've read from that author that I gave five stars, the author gets one third of a point. So if I read three books from an author and I give them all five stars, they would have a full point, 100% favorite author status. A four-star book gets the author an eighth of a point, so you need eight four-star books to total up to favorite author status. Or you could do two five-star books and three four-star books. A three-star brings that author a negative 15th of a point. So it's not that much negative points, but it is some negative points. Because yes, three star books are books that I like, but they're not books that I love. They're not books that I'm obsessed with. They're not the kind of books that gets you points in the favorite author department. A two star book brings negative eighth of a point, and a one star book brings the hefty penalty of a negative third of a point. Just three one stars from an author could bring them from favorite author status all the way back down to zero. So I've run every single book and author I've ever read through this formula, and that has produced a list of favorite authors. It's pretty exclusive. Right now there's only 10 authors on that list. I'm planning to make a video about those 10 favorite authors soon, so if you have any questions for me about those, leave them in the comments. And the quest of this video is to find a new favorite author. I have quite a few authors that are really close to getting to that 100%. So I'm going to be reading a book from three of those favorite author candidates today. Each of these authors is one five-star book away from making it to the Favorite Author Hall of Fame. I'm going to be reading books from Heather Fawcett, Kristen Kashour, and Naomi Novik today. Wish me luck that I add an 11th author to my Favorite Author Hall of Fame list. Hello! One of our favorite author candidates is Heather Fawcett. Currently, she sits at a score of 0.67. I've only read two books by Heather Fawcett before, and they were both five stars. So we are already at two thirds of a point. If I get a five star, she will hit full favorite author status. And this will be a new record. The only author that I've given only five stars in my favorite authors. The two books that I've read before from Heather Fawcett are of course the two books in the Emily Wilde series, which were my favorite books of 2023. So. Things are looking pretty good. I've decided to read The Grace of Wild Things. Right now I'm 25% into it and I'm loving it. So this is a story about a orphan girl named Grace and she has some natural witch magic and she doesn't fit in at the orphanage or, and she wants to learn how to use her magic. So she decides to run away to the witch that lives in the woods and try to become her apprentice. Now this book is very much inspired by an homage to Anna Green Cables, where the setting and vibes are very much aligned there, except also at a witch. And this witch, it's definitely a wicked witch, <laughs> where um, she literally does try to eat Anne and is very grumpy grump. But eventually Anne wins her over and becomes her temporary apprentice. But if Anne doesn't manage to master some magic spells in the next year, she loses her magic and may also get eaten by the witch. <laughs> and I am loving this. Like, yes, I'm kind of picky in books, but I feel like it's not that hard to make me happy. Like, I love fun quests with the deadline, like Grace having to learn all this magic. I like relationships between characters that have conflict in built in, like between Grace and the Wicked Witch. I love cute happy times, just don't make them boring. And this book is succeeding on all fronts. We also have the beginnings of Grace making friends with the other local children in the area and, and also a fairy boy she encountered in the woods. And her personality very much, Anne of Green Gables, she's overly dramatic, stubborn, argumentative, and it's so entertaining to be following this narrator. I think another thing that's really working for me is Grace. It, I think another thing that's really working for me is the audiobook is very well performed, which very well meshes with Grace's overly dramatic monologues that she gives. The target audience of this book is definitely middle grade, and so far, I would so widely recommend this book to everyone from beginning readers to adults because it's so entertaining and fun and I'm loving it. Now, predicted rating right now, 
I think I'm only going to say four stars because I'm loving it, but I'm not quite obsessed with it yet. But we'll see where this takes us, you know? Very excited. <laughs> I have finished The Grace of Wild Things and I loved it. It was so cute and fun and just like perfect pacing where we were constantly having fun successes where Grace would make a new friend, where she would master a new part of witchy spells and then she'd have a downside where she fails a spell or she loses a friend and it was enchanting and fun and charming all the way through. The ending I gotta say it was pretty unexpected to me. I think maybe if you knew the story of Anne of Green Gables much better than I did, you might have been able to see it coming. But for me, I was shocked. I'm not sure if I like it, but like I really respect the ending anyway. I think I just really love this main character archetype of the Anne in this book, The Grace, who is full of herself, but in such an entertaining and endearing way where she knows exactly how powerful and awesome and how deserving of respect she is and also makes a fool of herself quite regularly. I also love how well this book sets its tone as playful, but also witchy and a little bit dark. It's very much a book that could belong in both the sunshine and fun of spring or the spookiness of the fall. I think honestly the cover is a little too playful fun and maybe should include a little bit spookier elements because like wow this witch that race runs away to live with pretty wicked. It's a book that well it never gets so dark that it's like inappropriate for children or truly scary it does get just dark enough for you to go ooh this is some fun witchcraft. I very much find myself itching for a sequel to this book. If there was one, I would read it in a heartbeat, but I also respect that it's a standalone and I think it really told the story it wanted to tell quite well. Now, of course, the question is now, what am I going to rate this book? Because if it gets five stars, then Heather Fawcett gets to join the ranks of official favorite authors. And I think I'm going to give it four stars. I loved this book but not quite five stars. And I think a lot of that is just the mismatch of this book is very much for middle grade audience, target age around 10 years old, I'd say. And there was a lot in this book for me to love. And I would definitely recommend it to all age ranges, but it didn't quite give me what I want from a book. There wasn't quite enough depth for me to give it five stars, you know? But a four star is definitely still a win. I loved this book. And though it doesn't enable Heather Fawcett to become an official favorite author, it does get her closer. And I'm very excited to feature her in a future round and video of reading from favorite author candidates. The next of our favorite author candidates is Kristen Kishore. Right now, she's sitting at a score of 81%. Here's her star rating distribution. As you can see, we've had our good share of five stars, but also a two star. And these books all belong in the same series, which is the Graceling Realm series. Some of the books in that series are fantasy romance, and some of them are fantasy coming of age. And the fantasy romance ones are my favorites. <laughs> so it's with a little bit of apprehension that I went into this next book, which is There Is a Door in This Darkness, which is her newest release. And this one is not a romanticy like I love from Kristen Kishore. It is a contemporary fiction with a dash of magic. Right now, I'm 21% into this book, and I'm really not having a good time. And I think there's two parts to me not having a good time with it. Let's talk about part A. This is where this book is just boring. There's not enough happening. There's not enough at stake. We are following a teenager named Wilhelmia and she's just graduated high school, but she's not going to college because it's November, 2020. Everything's still shut down because of the pandemic and she's needed at home to help support and assist her family. She's feeling incredibly isolated. Her two best friends are in a quarantine bubble together and they are often seeing each other without her and it's bringing her much angst. She's also still wrestling with the grief of the death of one of her beloved aunts a few years ago and she's still not really getting over that. She's dealing with chronic pain. Just a lot in her life is very angsty and and then the story kicks off when she meets a fortune teller on the road who tells her a very dramatic prophecy that tomorrow her donut will be stale. And then the next day she goes and gets donuts and it's stale. And then the boy who works at the donut shop, who's also one of her classmates, is also mixed up in this magic fortune business. And they start working together and seeing each other more because of it. I'm not loving this plot because it doesn't feel like it's going anywhere. Like I can love an angsty main character, but I love them because you get to see their journey from becoming angsty to 
becoming better. And this book just doesn't have any hints of that yet. 20% in and our protagonist is still very much rejecting the hero's call, not wanting to do anything and showing no signs of changing anytime soon. This book doesn't really feel like it has any stakes or direction. It's just like a vague premise and angst. Now, part B of why I don't like this book is a little bit more tricky and it's because it has gotten preachingly political. Like every few pages we have a new speech on a new topic. And I can be okay with politics in books. I think books are a really good way to discuss real world issues through different lenses. I think political things and tragedies often affect people's lives and that's a thing that we can explore in fiction. However, I only like it if it's actually like relevant and important to the plot. Interesting political commentary? Yeah, I'm down. Random political commentary shoved into the plot in a way that it doesn't actually help anything happening? No. If I wanted boring political commentary, I could turn to nonfiction. If it's in my fiction, it needs to at least interact with the plot in some way. It needs to change the stakes. Our characters need to have something on the line that is connected to this political issue. And this book just keeps giving us random speeches about the pandemic and COVID responses and Trump and politics and all of this stuff. And like, I totally agree with the book on all of its points. And yet it's still so obnoxious that it's constantly interrupting the very small and barely interesting plot that we have. So it is with great regret that I think I'm going to give up on this book because it doesn't seem like it's gonna let up anytime soon and I'm just hating this writing style. I think I'm gonna give it two stars. Which now puts Kristen Kishore at 68%, which is still in the favorite author candidate pool. <laughs> just barely. But I don't think I'm going to be rushing to pick up her next book if it's another young adult contemporary. If it's a young adult romanticy, I will be there in a heartbeat though. So let's hope that the next book of the video will be better. The next five star author candidate up is Naomi Novik. Here is my star rating distribution of Naomi Novik books so far. I have read all of her books but a single trilogy, which we're starting in this video. So all of the four star books belong to a single series, which is the Temeraire series. It is a Napoleonic War reimagining but with fun dragons. It's very goofy, campy. The three star here for Naomi Novik is Uprooted. I liked it, didn't love it. It's loosely a Beauty and the Beast retelling, but with a lot of focus on like discovering your own magic through Polish folklore influences. And then the two star is Spinning Silver, which is loosely a retelling of Rumpelstiltskin, which I felt like was too unfocused, split its narrative too many times across too many point of views and just didn't give me enough heart. I haven't yet given Naomi Novik five stars, but I'm hopeful. Now this puts Naomi Novik currently at a score of 93%, the highest of any favorite author candidate we have yet discussed. And this means if the next book I read from her is five stars, she will join the favorite author Hall of Fame. But if the next book I read from her is four stars, that is also enough to put her into the favorite author Hall of Fame. Like she is that close. So the book I decided to read is A Deadly Education. And at this point, I've already finished A Deadly Education. I neglected to check in in the middle. So let's discuss it. So our main character is a teenage girl named Galadriel. She's been raised off the grid in this commune and she had to leave home to go to a boarding school because she is a witch starting to come into her powers and the monsters around the world can sniff out her magic and are targeting her. So she needs to go somewhere a little safer, which is the Scholomance. This school has quite an interesting structure where there's no teachers, it's all just self-study and the students are just grateful to be there because it's a place with less density of monsters than the outside world. However, there's still quite a lot of monsters that find their way sneaking into the school. So the setting is very much an on the edge of your seat, there could be a monster in every single hallway kind of setting. And this really bleeds through to the way that our protagonist, who goes by Elle for most of the book, interacts with her environment. She's incredibly paranoid. She's always taking precautions, always checking every single loose end to make sure that a monster isn't going to surprise jump out at her. And because these monsters are always at the top of her mind, it is very 
forefront in the narration of the book. You're always getting these somewhat info dumps, but very in a chatty manner about the different monster types and also the politics between the students at the school. There's very much a lot of world building that's being continuously handed to you in every scene. And I can see that definitely being a downside for some people, but I think I loved it. It never got so much that I felt like it overpowered the character development or the larger plot, but it was definitely there enough to get me very interested in this world. My favorite part of this book was definitely our protagonist Elle herself, where she has an affinity for magic of deadly destruction. Where other people might be extra good at alchemy or extra good at fire spells, she's extra good at spells that can murder a lot of people really quickly. And there's been these prophecies looming around her her entire life that she's going to become like basically the Dark Lord and she doesn't want this. And she also has this like aura of just like general evilness that everyone around her can kind of sense. And so she really struggles with making friends, where she's always getting rejected by people who can sense that, oh, that one's the Dark Lord in training, isn't she? And then because of this, she's become very prickly. She's kind of adopted the attitude of like, well, I didn't want to be your friend anyway. If they're all going to reject me, I'm not even going to try. And she is consistently rude and mean to like everyone in the book. Even as she goes through her character development and starts warming up to a few people and starting to start to make friends, she's still consistently rude to them. And I think that's another thing that could be a big turnoff for a lot of people in this book, is that just like our, our protagonist is unlikable and unsociable. But I think it's another thing that I loved about this book <laughs> because she was so entertaining. Every single interaction between her and another character is just like hinged on this conflict of is she going to be able to drive them away with her behavior? And then that led to the further internal conflict when she finally does have a little bit of success making friends that she realizes, oh wait, this is nice. Maybe I should try to be nice to some people. It's not a complete lost cause. I think this character archetype reminded me a lot of Emily Wilde from Emily Wilde's Encyclopedia of Fairies, which is another book that is widely disliked because of its dislikable main character, but like I loved for that. That like, yeah, she's consistently rude and a little bit mean to pretty much everyone in this book, but she's not irredeemable and I loved getting the insight into her psyche and her character arc because of how she treats other people. She's got a lot of conflicting desires in herself. Like she wants to show off her magic and show people that like, hey, I'm really strong and you should respect me. But she also doesn't like want people to fear her. And she knows that the only magic like she can do is the type of magic that people are going to be afraid of her for. This book also explores a lot the social injustice in the magical wizarding world, where there's these enclaves, these collections of wizards that provide a lot of protection and help to the wizards in their care. So like, good, but they're incredibly stingy about who they give that help to. It turns in to these family dynasties of wealth, of prosperity and safety, where the other wizards, like our main character who has grown up outside of the enclaves, are struggling just to stay alive and like struggling so hard to get into this enclave system that's fundamentally oppressive to outsiders. And one of our other characters is a boy named Orion, and he is like the golden boy of one of these enclaves, the son of the wealthiest, most powerful people in America. And there's a lot of tension between them in their relationship, not just because she's super rude black cat personality and he's like golden retriever and sunny boy kind of personality, but also because they come from such different backgrounds where he has so much privilege that is at the expense of people outside of the enclaves and he doesn't recognize it. And then he has his own character arc where he comes to recognize some of his own privilege and realize that the system he's part of and benefiting from is fundamentally flawed and needs to be revamped. And like, I loved their relationship. They start hanging out because he suspects that she's like gonna be the Dark Lord and wants to keep an eye on her because of his hero complex. And then as they spend more time together and get to know each other more, it evolves into more of an actual friendship. And like, I loved their dynamic through and through how they're such opposites in like every way and yet they do work so well together and I ship it. I ship it and I need to read the next book because I did not get enough of romance between them in this one but I think it's coming. So I loved this book. Like it's exactly the book for me. I recognize that it's not going to be for everyone but I would say if you like both the struggling to make friends because you're a really scary person vibe of Murderbot Diaries, and if you like the grumpy, rude, competent woman 
who is also paired with very sunshine, not always super competent man in Emily Wilde. And these are two of my favorite series of all time. And if you love both of those like I love them, you need to read A Deadly Education. But at this point, this book is taking a spot as one of my favorite books of all time. And I'm holding off on that until I read the sequels, right? It kind of depends on how the story continues to play out, but I am obsessed with this book. I love it so much. I want to reread it. I want to read the sequels. I want to talk to people about it. Like, this is exactly the book for me. It's combining, like, several of my favorite books of all time into one, and, like, it's, it's a masterpiece. So, of course, I'm giving it five stars. Which puts Naomi Novik at... 1.27. 127% favorite author. She has reached the list of favorite authors. And I am so happy about that. I'm so excited to read more of her stuff. So let's recap. I read The Grace of Wild Things, gave it four stars, which brought Heather Fawcett up from a 67 to a 79%. I then read There Is a Door in This Darkness by Kristen Kishore, gave it two stars, which brought her down from an 81 to a 68%, but is still just barely in the running for favorite author status. And then I read A Deadly Education by Naomi Novik, loved it, gave it five stars, I'm obsessed with it, which brought her up from a 93 to a 127%. I love it. So join me next time. I have two videos planned in this favorite author series. One, I'm going to be talking through all of the favorite authors that are currently on my list because we got a new one let's talk about it and two i'm also planning to continue to make five star author candidate videos and this round of favorite author candidates went so much better than last round which you can watch here